that. The vines don't die per se. They'll send out a secondary shoot, but that may or may not have fruit. So we could lose 50% of our crop in the space of three hours. Wow. Whoa. In uh, 2016, April 9th, April 12th, we got a pretty severe frost and we ended up making two barrels of Viognier or 16 acres. So it's, it's one of those. Oh my gosh. Yeah, and, and we're, we're susceptible up until about May 15th. So we're, we're looking at another frost event this weekend. Right. We've got to be out there and we use all sorts of machines to try and pull that warmer air down and mix wow. it with cold air and just to try and raise it above that 32. If we get to 33 and 34, more than likely we'll come out of it okay. Okay. Yeah. Steven's cool. a machine, man. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Need, need it. It's so, a big heater. <laughs> no, sleep is needed. It's, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, it's, it's just one of those things um, we've had. I mean, it's such a juxtaposition because it's so beautiful outside. You know, there's not a breath. The sky yeah. is clear. The stars are bright. And then you're admiring the beauty of nature. And then you're going, oh, God, but she's kicking my backside and destroying my vineyard. So uh, exactly. the yin-yang of um, she's kind of being temperamental. But yet, you, if you stop for two seconds, the beauty around you is just incredible. But uh, exactly. to run it, and, and most of the damage sometimes happens between that 6, 7.30 range. Just right. before the sun peaks up. But um, we, we managed to keep it the last two days above 32. But into Saturday, we got down to like 29, 29.5. And we had some damage. So, right. yeah, it goes. Uh, Cheers to a healthy crop. Yeah. yeah, and to you guys too. I know farming, there are easier places in the world to farm than Virginia. So uh, <laughs> we appreciate what you guys do over there as well. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, I have to apologize. We're, it seems like our connection is dropping in and out um, on Facebook Live. So we just restarted it. Uh, but I'll be recording this whole session as well. So for those of us who are, are joining, hopefully you're able to get back in. And, uh, and we'll post this video on Facebook um, and, and continue sharing it as well. So with, with that being said, um, Stephen, I know we've got three fantastic vignettes, and you can see the difference in them just in the color alone from the 17 which is pretty dark all the way up to the 19 which I mean there's a dramatic difference in color there uh, so why don't you walk us through some of these wines probably starting then with the 17 the oldest sure um, so we're dealing with Viognier which is our largest planted variety on the property out of the 70 acres we've got uh, 16 acres dedicated to the grape and the grape is, is somewhat obscure. It's not as familiar to people as if you said Pinot Gris and Chardonnay, everyone knows what you're talking about. When you talk about Viognier, they kind of look at you and, and they're not 100% sure, but it's very famous in the Northern Rhone in Condrieu and Chateau Grier. And it is um, officially the state grape of Virginia. I don't know if a lot of people know that, but it is Virginia's oh. state grape. Um, and it makes wines that are, are, are a bit of a chameleon because there's a lot of things you can do to it. But uh, some of the challenges in the vineyard, uh, we'll talk about how we make it and then jump into the wines if that's okay and take any questions. But, you know, we were just talking to the guys from Sidia, uh, Castle Hill rather. Um, it buds fairly early. So with our, our adverse weather, it's, it's somewhat susceptible to frost. And that is something we got to watch out for in the vineyard through May 15th, mid-May. Um, because we get bud break in the first week of April, 1st of April, somewhere there, depending on how moderate the winter was. And then those shoots are obviously susceptible to any temperatures below that. But if we get through frost, um, it's, a, it's a finicky grape. It doesn't produce a lot of tonnage per acre. You know, for us, one and a half, one to three quarters of, of a ton per acre is quite normal. Um, you know, it also is, is pretty susceptible to, to mildew. And if it gets a lot of rain, you know, you can deal with some sort of rot issues as well. But then if you get a good, good sort of growing season, um, when you pick it is, is very much a, a, a factor that really kind of um, changes the aromatic and the, and the flavor profile. If you pick it really green, you get a lot of the malic acid, which is green apple, and then you get more of sort of the melon and the pear. And then those flavors kind of develop into more sort of stone fruits. And then if you pick it really ripe, you can get a lot of sort of peach and apricots and honeysuckle and stuff like that. The problem with Viognier, if you pick it that ripe, you lose a lot of the natural acidity. And Viognier, a lot of times, is described as flabby. It's very textured. It's very oily. But we don't have a lot of acidity. And I think um, when it comes to winemaking, acidity is, is such a key component. 
It balances out the fruits, it balances out residual sugar, and it also allows the wines to age. So um, from 17 through 19, three very distinct styles, obviously three very different vintages, 18 being the wettest out of the bunch, um, around 90 inches of rain during the growing season, where 17 and 19 were at that sort of 40, 42 inches, which is normal. Um, the 17, obviously, very, very dark and honeyed in color. Um, that's due to the age, number one. It's been in the bottle for two years, and also the fact that it's uh, the only wine that sees uh, a semblance of oak, barrel fermented and matured. Uh. The 18, the difference there being it's a little bit sweeter. It has a little bit of perceptible residual sugar. We're looking at um, around 0.56 or five and a half grams per liter, which is at that sort of threshold where people can pick up sugar. Yeah. So people always ask why add a little bit of sugar where you can't really pick it up. It actually does, you know, kind of play around with that, that balance. It gives you that sort of sweetness without being sort of a, a saccharide sweetness. Yeah, right. Sweetness on the nose, but it's just to balance out the acid. Like and then um, the 19, I think, really reflects uh, a bit of a style and a paradigm shift of what we're doing. Sort of very bright, picked a little bit greener. Um, you know, trying to accentuate more that stone fruit character and really build the wine on, on acid. And uh, it'd be interesting to see what you guys guys think of it over there. Your your expertise and what you drink a lot of is cider. Um, I know I drink more wine and less cider. I'm sure you drink more cider and less wine. So it's always interesting to see kind of professionals from another sort of sphere taste your products and critique it. And yeah, we'd love to, to kind of just have a conversation. I don't really like lecturing about wine. I'd love to know what you think, positive and negative, and ask uh, and answer questions as as they come in and. Um, what I would do is I would go youngest to oldest. I'd actually start with the 19, which is on my right, and, and work to the 17. I think it's going to be lighter and brighter, and then we're going to end up with a fully textured wine. So, yeah, the 19 is, is quite pale compared to, as Brian rightly pointed out, I mean, the difference is, is stark. I mean, the 19 is, is tank fermented, tank matured, and as the name suggests, it, it gets pressed off into tank, it gets inoculated in tank, it ferments in a tank, and it matures in a tank um, until we bottled it. And we bottled it really quickly. We bottled it January 31st. Uh, it's a 19 vintage again, which means the grapes for, for that wine were harvested in the year of 19. It is 100% Viognier. Uh, all these wines are 100% estate grown as well. There's no blending and they're all 100% Viognier. Uh, within wow, awesome. wine, we can actually blend up to 25% of another varietal and still call it Viognier. Uh, so we really wow. want to... Um, reflect either the terroir differences because we have four blocks of Viognier, vintage differences, but stylistically there has to be some sort of harmonious compartment. You know, it has to be recognizable as Virginia number one, which is important, and then obviously you know Keswick. So I get a lot of sort of stone fruit character, very bright minerality, and everyone says like, what the heck is minerality? It's hard to explain, but it's I find it as a non-fruit, non-spice, non-herbaceous component. It's kind of like, you know, when you walk on the beach and that, that wind blows across and that sea salt hits you in the face. Exactly. The chalkiness or, you know, oysters, you know, when you've had oysters and that sort of seashell kind of character. Um, mm. and I love it. It's bright. It's vibrant. You know, uh, the last thing I'd say before I turn it over to anybody is, you know, we don't make food friendly wines. You know, um, I don't think wine should require food to make it drinkable. Sometimes right. you just want to drink wine. You want to drink yeah. cider. And sometimes, you know, I, I call this a bit of a porch pounder sometimes. Because you come <laughs> and you sit on the porch and two bottles later, you know, dinner is, is a far afterthought. You know? <laughs> um, kind of like Taco Bell is going to be great right now. And that's what we do. Yeah. So, yeah. So cheers to you guys, by the way. Uh, we appreciate you. you. Big fans of yours and your tasting last week. But 2019 VNA, one of my favorites, but very much a, a stylistic change in, in how we're approaching VNA right now. So this is the one we're starting with. Um, if you're if you're catching us live, drinking along with us, or if you're watching this video afterwards and, and drinking the wines with us, starting with the 2019 VNA. And yeah, I noticed right off the bat, it is a lot more green and, and fresh than I typically imagine VNAs to be. Yeah, I think, you know, the um, if you think of the world of wine, you know, a lot of people look at it as in terms of food and wine. You look at sommeliers, it's always about freshness and vibrancy and tension, acidity. I think wines with acid are much more parable with food. If you think of it that way, wines that are really textured and rich, 
the sort of the food pairing, you know, kind of playing field is much more narrow. Um, and, and again, these wines are released fairly quickly. And because it's seasonal as well, when you're getting into hot and humid kind of months, drinking big, oaky driven textured wines is a little sort of contrary to what, what people want. You know, when you're hot, you want something that's cooling, can be chilled, yes. and that sort of acid just cuts through your palate. Um, so I think it's part of the seasonal, but then it's part of also experimenting how to make a different wine and how to make Viognier cool again. You know, right. um, because it's 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 a it's a wine that's a bit of sort of polarizing. Some people love it, some people don't. Um, you know, and that's why we're, we're fortunate that we make a few. So we have textured wines, and then we have bright wines, barrel tank somewhere in the middle. So I'd be interested to to hear what the the cider masters kind of think of it, or any comments negatively or positively. Well, so far, I mean, I think that you're very fortunate in um, your your picking thresholds of you know uh, right versus less right. And that broad spectrum of different, fl that palette, I mean, is just, is, is very broad from, like you said, the stone fruits, the melon, the pear from um, the, you know, being greener. And then when it's more ripe, you start getting the honeysuckle. Sure. But I mean, my, the nose, I almost picked up, I thought you know, there's some honeysuckle here. You know, it's very close. It's got a nice, you know, a floral. Yeah. You know, very clean. It's still, I mean, yeah, this is, this is porch dangerous. <laughs> you know. that, that belongs in a t-shirt but you're right when you when you talk about <laughs> floral uh you're talking about terpenes which um is what viognier has in abundance which it shares the same sort of um like riesling and muscat it has that same sort of flavor profile um so yeah that floral honeysuckle yes. that sort of descriptor is a lot of what you what you um kind of when you describe viognier you hear it a lot the other thing is with 16 acres what we sometimes do is we go pick a portion of the block green and that's the acidity portion of the wine. Then we let mm. the rest of the block mature and that's flavor development. And then you go and pick a portion of the block really, really late if the weather allows you to do so. And that's the really flabby, sweetish kind of flavor. And that's how you can also build up complexity in the wine. You, make, you might make one DNA, but it's actually multiple components picked over a couple of weeks. So that's beautiful. beautiful. Yeah. So. I, I think for me, uh, you know, I'm not, my palate isn't as discerning as Don's is. And so I, I, I taste this and it, it tastes like a summer night to me. It's, it tastes like something that, you know, I would start like early evening and then I would, you know, keep drinking it underneath the stars until like eight or nine, if I could make it that long. But I mean, it's, it's amazing. I mean, it's, it's, it's so light and it, it's, it's not something that's going to fill me up, but it's something that I just taste. It's just a good drinkable wine to me. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. No, I, I appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, the other thing about wine, I mean, don't, don't you feel sometimes wine and cider, the terminology just makes everything so confusing? It does. Uh, when you talk about carboxylic acids, and most people don't give a rubbish about that. They just <laughs> it smells great and it tastes great. And what we want people to do and go, I don't know how to describe it, but I'm going to drink it. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> it's great though. You know, so you do have a discerning palate. You know, it's yours. Yes. Yeah, the, the Thank you. Rule of thumb is drink what you like, how you like, when you like. Yes. Um, I would drink this. Mic drop. We're done. Finish. <laughs> right. But. So, how long of the fermentation process are we looking at? Yeah. So, um, you're in the fermentation game. Um, so, firstly, a lot of our wines are uninoculated. These are inoculated for a couple of reasons. Um, we're fermenting actually fairly cool. Uh, we use uh, a yeast called uh, VIN13, which we spoke about a little bit. Um, we also use a yeast called GRE, which I think was yes. the only thing about. So they both sacrifice yeast service here. Um, but what we're trying to do is we, we're trying to stress the ferment, you know, so we don't feed it heavily. So we're using a yeast that actually can, can operate at low nitrogen levels. And we're right. doing for about 28 days. So okay. 28 days, we're fermenting in the, in the low 50s. Um, and fermentation is regarded once, you know, all that sugar is scavenged and the hydrometer drops to the bottom. And then sure. the, uh, the other thing is um, we don't allow our wines to go through secondary fermentation. Okay. When we talk about conservation of acidity. I, I always ask winemakers, if, if people always say the wines don't have enough natural acid, why do we allow our white wines to go through secondary fermentation? And then we sure. take that really bright green apple acid and turn it into a lactic acid. Right. Um, and that, that has been something we've, we've played around with. And 
we, we don't allow that. We try and conserve the one sort of aspect of grape growing that I think makes white wines incredible, and that's acidity, obviously. Absolutely. Yeah. So, 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 when, so when you talk about not letting it go to a second fermentation, how is that possible? So you, you basically inhibit it. Um, so the, the yeast dies naturally. Okay. So, uh, a lot of people allow the wines to do that by adding um, Enococcus uni, which is a lactic acid bacteria. Okay. And basically it's a decarboxylation and then the malic acid, which is a green apple, it's like a granny smith. Yeah. Into lactic, which is milk. So okay. you think of tart, bright, upfront, softer, rounder, richer, right? Got so it. We, um, we kill the yeast by scavenging all the sugar. We add sulfur, which inhibits, um, you know, any further development. And then okay. we lower the temperature. So we make it really, really hard for the wines to ferment. And with a higher acid environment, bacteria doesn't really grow in a high, in a low, a low or a high acid, low pH environment. Okay. We probably do get some secondary fermentation, but we try and inhibit it as much as possible. Got it. Okay. Yeah. So, so I know the way we do that, right, is by we cross flow it. Right, yeah. is that what we're doing? Well, we're removing all of that out of there. Okay. Yeah. So it's a filtering process, so it's gone. Yeah, okay. so we're just basically one fermentation. Yeah, which, which um, we do as well. Um, so we do the filtration, but I don't know your timing. Our filtration is done just before bottling. Right. We're through sterile filtration to remove any bacteria or yeast, especially if we're bottling with uh, some RS or bottling wines that are non-ML, you know, right. there's 0.45 micron at least to make sure the wine is stable in the bottle. So very exactly. similar parallels between winemaking and cider making, I'm getting. Yeah, and then I, I, I realized after um, last week that I told you wrong when you had asked about sulfites, and we do use SO2, you know, and but we have like, you know, it's, it's a threshold of, you know, less than, you know, like 50 parts, uh, 80 parts per million, I think, can't get any, anything beyond that. And we'll kind of adjust that as we go. But yes, you know, we will use SO2 to stabilize. Yeah. You know? I mean, you know, we, we get that question a lot. This wine has a free sulfur of 25 ppm, which is 25 milligrams per liter. Right. A lot of times there's more sulfur in an egg than in a bottle of wine. Right. So it's, um, it's the one thing about acidity and the lower pH is l less sulfur is required at a, at a lower pH wine. So, uh, right. One way we can get away with actually using less sulfur is to make sure the wine is a bit more acidic and has a lower pH. So, um, and again, you know, you don't want the wine to taste chemically. Uh, you know what sulfur is like when you work with it. It's pungent. Yes. Uh, and there's nothing worse than, than a wine tasting medicinal. And especially if no one's ever tried your cider or wine before and yeah. they go, you know, that, that's their first impression of your winery. You know? Right, yes. You know, and B and A has got such pretty aromatics. I mean, it's gorgeous. It makes you want to drink more. It has that sort of beautiful, intoxicating sort of sweetness to it as well. But I, I love the nineteen. I, I think it's a great summertime wine. And oh yeah, I'm not going to say I, I'm going to drink a lot of it. I, I, I can tell you, I, I have been drinking a lot. Of it. <laughs> Indeed. Mm. But then um, I guess you know we can move on to the second one, and this is this is actually a very special wine to us. Um, and if I may just talk about the, the label. So this is this yeah, it's a, a gorgeous label. Yeah, it's um you know it has a, a sad story behind it. It's a tribute label to our owner's sister Genevieve. So if I walk you through the label, if you can do it. So Hamar Genevieve at the top, tribute, Le Vendange means the wind of angels. Vendange is French for harvest. Um, the the fleur de lis up over here, their mother was French. Uh, it says do no harm in Latin. She was a doctor. She had dogs. So you've got two dogs either side. And if you look just to the right of her in the cloud, there's a, there's a hidden, hidden dog, right? Well, I can't point, but there's a hidden <laughs> dog right there. Two swans. Uh, her and her husband used to have swans on their necklaces with swans made for life. And if you drive into our property, you exactly. see exactly ones. And then the other cool thing is the caduceus, the snake on the cross is the, yes. in the hair. And it was a lot going on. It was, and it's and it's designed by um, Brian's sister, my sister-in-law, Chris. So it is a it, it's a wine that has a, a very sort of emotional tie-in to the to the family. And every time we make this wine, we we think of her, and, and she was such a kind-hearted and beautiful person. And if we can make a wine that that sort of kind of expresses those characteristics, then we've done we've done her justice. But oh, that's beautiful. That's amazing. Yeah. So. 
Um, this is our 2018 Le Bondange. And, you know, the problem when you, when you put a different label on a wine, uh, the perception is that it's, it's a weaker wine or it's a different wine. Not, not, not mm. at all. Um, this, this is the wine that has a little bit of RS. I don't know if you can pick it up. And it's from a vintage. I mean, you, you're, you're a farmer. You've gone through this. I mean, it didn't yeah. stop raining. We, we always joke that it only rained twice in, in Keswick, once for 30 days consecutively <laughs> and once for 40 days consecutively. Exactly. I mean, so this was picked as, as green, as underripe as, as you can get. I mean, it was, if we talk about all that nonsense of wine is made in the uh, in vineyard, Yes. We threw that manual out in 18. Wine was definitely made in the cellar, I tell you that much. That's right. Um, but I am, I am thrilled to death with this wine. It, it, uh, it has that sort of beautiful nose. Again, probably a little bit more peach and honeysuckle than the 19, even right. though it was greener from a physiological point of view. Right. Yeah. So why would that be then, Stephen, if, if, you know, if 19 was... Um, well, yeah, why would this be, I'm, I'm sorry, different than the 19 in that regard? I don't, I don't know, to be honest with you. It could have been, we, we, we used uh, different yeasts. Um, we pressed it incredibly lightly. You know, I think with uh, Viognier, if you press it too hard, you can get a lot of sort of pithiness from the skins. Um, so we don't, don't press it all the way dry. You know, we get maybe 120 gallons of, of juice out of, the, out of a ton. Um, we we kind of handled it so delicately, but honestly, I, I have no idea why it turned out that well. Um, certainly not because of me. Uh, I think <laughs> it maybe shows the strength of the vineyard. Um, right. maybe it shows that the right grape was planted on the right site, that a good site, even in adverse climatic conditions, can produce intense wine. Um, but I think it's possibly got to do with the touch of residual sugar. Um, you know, that, that sort of floral, which is, I think, varietally derived. Yeah. But I think the touch of residual sugar really, really helps this wine. It doesn't have the, ac the acid of the 19, but I think it's got really pretty aromatics. Um, when we were drinking your Serendipity last week, I was thinking of this wine. I think there's a lot of similarities between yeah. the Serendipity and this LVA Viognier. Absolutely. Man. It's so funny. The, the 2018, you know, again, you know, I think that like what Brian was saying, you know, well, if this was picked so early and you still had those notes of honeysuckle and whatnot, they're more indicative of a riper grape. Mm -hmm. Why is it showing up here? But it's kind of similar with us with, you know, the serendipity from 2018. It had this bold, you know, kind of profile that we were not expecting at all. It's like, this doesn't yeah. make sense, but it's relearning us. <laughs> we, we, we just went with it. This is what we did. <laughs> no, look, and, and, and I want to put it out there. Uh, you got to try Castle Hill Cider and their serendipity was incredible. Ah, thank you so thank much. You. Thank you. Thank you. So for all you, you haven't, they've got a beautiful site, but incredible site. You've got to check them out, check their website out. And that serendipity is as well with it. And I, I don't normally like sweet wines. I always think I'm sweet enough. Um, I, ah. love, I love that side. I guzzled that whole thing. That grab was gone that day. That's what Awesome. Thank you very much. Cheers. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So this is magnificent. Well, we can't wait till we can actually raise a glass in person together. Oh yeah, my God. Yeah. That's what we're all looking forward to. Uh, yeah, that, that's the day we put the keys in a bucket and we call an Uber. Okay. <laughs> that's right. Yeah, exactly. right. We look forward to it. 18, you know, I, I think part of it as well is um, the psychological aspect. We all know how tough 18 was. So you have lower expectations. When you have an incredible vintage, you have that's this right. expectation of these wines are going to sing to you in a glass. So maybe the, the wine's not as good as the 19, but the vintage was so much worse that the 18 just comes across better. Mm. I, you know, I, what I, I love about wine is wine has to be emotional and wine has to be intellectual. You know, sure. if there's no oh, yeah. drinking something and go, yeah, that's been, yeah, I've had a bunch before and I can get it for cheaper. You yeah. want to have wines that really make you think and make you kind of, um, and again, make you feel something. But so partly it's, it's the label, which, you know, is, a, is very much an emotional connection to our family. Partly is, um, I think, the strength of the vineyard really, really shined through. And what a lot of people don't know about 18, if it wasn't for 18, 19 would have been a much different vintage because 19, we went to, into drought conditions. And if it wasn't for the, the rainfall from 18, I think our vines would have shut down. Um, we wouldn't have produced sugars. And I, I think we would have yeah. dealt with all wonky kind of fruit. So while 18 gets a lot of bad press, I think, you know, kind of, um, funnily enough, though, it, it was the saving grace of the 19. That's awesome. 
Yeah. Interesting. There's also the tail of this. There's like a almost like a for me a wisp. It's like this. It's like this. I don't know how to describe it exactly, but like the finish is really interesting because it's it's there and then it just kind of like whisks away and it's like nice little mm -hmm. and then just like it leaves it it's just very clean it finishes very clean yeah we we do a lot of um so we look at yeast obviously in terms of fermentation but we actually treat the yeast after the fact really um really diligently i don't know uh, it's a good question for you do you guys do a lot of surly aging and batonage and stirring cider on spent lease or no actually not with not with our traditional ciders. Um, now with the um, the Palmo and the ports, we mm -hmm. did we did that um, the batonage, and we have you know two Palmos right now that are in Keswick barrels. Yeah. Um, thank you all again, very very much. You're quite and um, two punchins, and yeah, yeah. So like you know every about every at least once a month we're we're having to. Um, you know, add a little bit back to it because of the evaporation and whatnot and yeah, some transpiration yeah. going on with the oak. And then whenever we do that, we will take you know, this nice little hook and, you know, stir everything up from the bottom. But that's really the only time that we do that. We have, I've got a cider right now that was an experimental batch that, you know, had a little, um, a little heavy on the hydrogen sulfide, you know, um, so it's okay. Yeah. And I'm experimenting with different ways of cleaning that up, you know, and there's you know, there's some some things in the back pocket that I know will work, but I'm trying some different ways from some folks that have mentioned you know kind of old ways, just you know agitating it, you know staring at it very harshly. I've heard works, <laughs> um, you know, but <laughs> I, I've heard staring at it and scolding it works like a dream. <laughs> <laughs> we do a lot of scolding, you know. No, but we want um, to do more. I mean, that's that's a, a great thing that we want to do is you know more experimentation with the barrel, especially taking some of these ciders that are traditionally, you know, we can hold the apples for a while and we have, you know, a, a consistency that we shoot for, but then we're pressing things pretty quickly, you know, and then we pull that, you know, as we can, and then we'll cross load, filter out, and then we bottle it. So it'd be nice to have that luxury of letting it sit for a while and mature and age yeah. rather than just the expediency of putting it out there kind of, and we're kind of, this is this whole situation right now that's challenging all of us is affording a luxury that we would normally not take for ourselves. This is really good, by the way. This is delicious. Yeah. You know, I like that you keep talking, I just keep drinking. <laughs> we appreciate it. Someone's yeah. got to drink. But uh, you made up some really, really incredible points. Um, uh, I, I actually, to be honest with you, I like H2S in our wines. We make our wines quite reductively. Um, and for those out there that might not know what we're talking about, we're talking about hydrogen sulfide and it's, it's used a lot in propane to, to show that you have a leak or something like that. Um, and it can come from sort of obviously low nitrogen and instead of throwing through the glycolytic pathway, it goes through the sulfur reducing pathway. But I kind of like that sort of thiolytic kind of character in wines, you know, that sort of flinty gun smoke. Yes. Thiol is a sulfur containing compound. Right. So, um, we, we're making our wines more reductively because what nice. happens in the bottle is that it, it can age and it develops in the bottle more if you get that luxury of aging. Right. But I think it makes wines that are a little bit more sort of intriguing and a little bit more interesting. It's not for everyone. And I, I pushed the envelope a little bit in a petite verdot and it smelled uh, a little bit horsey, but- uh, Awesome, awesome, yeah. it definitely works. So what you use the word reductively. So can you explain that? Yeah, so reductive is the opposite of oxidation, right? So you're, you're making wines very anaerobically. But okay. I might, um, what that means is you, you might press under dry ice, a carbon dioxide, and you, you're pumping wine into a tank awesome. that is filled with an inert gas. So you have carbon dioxide, nitrogen, or argon, something like that. So you're basically protecting the wine and, and keeping as much oxygen away from it as possible, right? Right. But sometimes your wine can reduce. And so you're, you're talking essentially about compounds called VSCs, volatile sulfur compounds. And volatility, by definition, means the ability to vaporize. So, so a lot of people, when you have H2S, the first thing you do is you aerate it. That, right. That's simple. You swish it in the glass, you aerate it. Yes. Uh, we, we find that our wines are reductive. We'll do like a quick pump over and see if that blows off. Sure. If not, we'll look at sort of the nitrogen status. You know, the wine is, is not being fed and it's trying to, you know, kind of feed itself. It gets reduced. Right. Uh, and then at the end of the day, you can treat it, as you know, with, uh, with copper. You know, there right. are, are things that... 
People right. used to pop a copper penny into their exactly. wine. Yes. You got it, right? And yes. you would do that and that copper would react and it would take it away. So, right. but we're trying to make wines in a reduced way. We're actually not trying to feed our wines as much. We're trying to stress the yeast. So yeah. we have yeast that don't require a lot of food. We're right. actually creating a, a nutrient desert, so to speak, because nitrogen can feed the yeast, but it can feed a whole bunch of other yeasts and bacteria that we don't want as well. Right. And it's about trying to make wine that's individualistic, right? Because our job is to create a wine. The, the only thing that, that makes Keswick different than any other winery is the vineyard. Yes. And what we want you to do in a glass is to taste how the grape was grown, where the grape was grown. Right. Yes, if we, if we put a lot of oak on it, every winery has access to oak. Sure. If we use a lot of enzymes, then the wine becomes generic. Exactly. We're to make wines with character and soul. You know, we're not trying to make technically perfect wines. We're trying to make right. wines that make you feel or go, God, that's Viognier or that's Viognier from 2018. Holy hell. And if they do that, then that's, that's half the battle. That's more, that's more intriguing to us than anything else. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Cheers to that. We love that. Well done. Thank you. Well done. Well said, Stephen. And, and, and it's not just that it's an 18 um, Viognier or a Viognier from 18, but this actually won a gold medal in the Governor's Cup, too. And I, and I know you had mentioned Serendipity also won a gold medal, one of the yes. only fighters to do so. So congratulations to that as well. Cheers. Thank I you. also want to give um, a quick shout out to a couple of people who are following along on Facebook. So thank you so much for, for following along, everyone. Um, I think Camila Washington doesn't think you're sweet enough, Stephen. So uh, <laughs> we'll have to work on that. Wow. <laughs> um, but uh, Brian, Next time you, you and Ryan come here, I am not giving you a hug. <laughs> I'm have to get something for me. Last time. <laughs> uh, but Brian uh, also enjoys the finish of the 2018 Viognier, uh, which is yes, wonderful. Yes. I think that's one of the reasons it, it did so well in the Governor's Cup. Lynn Panto, Stephanie Maddox, thank you so much for following along. I'm glad you are enjoying these events that we're doing. Um, but yeah, so very informative. Uh, loving both the 19 and the 18. Now, how are these wines stylistically so different than the 17, which you can see just from the color alone is a much darker, deeper Viognier? Yeah, so um, both of those 18 and 19 vintage wines don't see any oak whatsoever. And um, with the 17, and this is, this is winemaking three years ago. And I think the, the challenge for us as, or anyone who produces a spirit or an artisanal product is to learn what they've done wrong and then build upon that, ah. make better wines, right? Exactly. Uh, and you know, these wines are very popular. And as the, as the sort of the paradigm shift, people drinking fresher, more vibrant wines, so the winemaking changes. But firstly, this is, um, fermented and matured in, in 500 liter French oak barrels. So you have the influence of oak and then you have the aging and the oxidation effect, which makes a, a very light wine turn into a, a little bit more of a golden color as well. You're dealing with the 2017 Viognier that is made in the opposite of reductive. It's made in more sort of an oxidative style. And as such, the color is a little bit different as well. I don't know if that answers your question, Brian. Oh, absolutely. Cool. So this is, without further ado, the 17 uh, Signature Series. And this is a, a label we pull out of the closet every now and again. And the, um, the signature is that of our owner, Mr. Al Schornberg. And if you think of, a, uh, of an endorsement, if you sign off on something, that's your stamp of approval, right? Right. Uh, there's nothing more than you can do. If you sign your name to something, you know, you're standing behind it. The story is kind of interesting. So uh, I don't know if you know, but I married the boss's daughter. Um, well done! <laughs> well, I, I needed a green card and needed to stay. <laughs> for, uh, no. So we got, we got married in, uh, in 2009. I look at my wrist because there's my, my wife's initials and our wedding date. Uh, That's awesome. Well done. Very nice. Well done. Yeah. Um, she's a, a shout out to Dr. Cass Schoenberg. She's a brilliant virologist, an amazing mom, and just all around good person. Love her a lot. Hey. Yeah, she can do better Cheers. than if she ever figures that out, we're in trouble. Yes. But, um, so we got married, and um, our, our tent, our reception was in front of the Viognier vines. And the vines nice. at that point were grown in a, in a sort of a, a ballerina system. And Al kind of went, this is not going to work for my daughter and went in and, and he says he, he made it look better. I thought he just chopped everything off. Um, <laughs> and unbeknownst to him, we took that fruit and we made a, a separate wine. And then one night at dinner, he doodled his 
signature on a label. And uh, we made two barrels of what then became the 2009 Signature Series Cab Franc. And wow. if we make a style that he really likes or he really endorses, uh, we, we put this label on. It's generally 50 to 100 cases, and it represents, we think, something that's unique, different, stylistic, um, maybe a bit polarizing. But the great thing about polarity is it makes people talk about it. Um, and, and if you come out with something different and you can have a conversation about it, I think that that's the, that's the best thing about it. So it's aged, it's hundred percent. The other thing is it's picked a little riper. So I don't know if you, you worry about alcohol levels. The first two are quite moderate, right. and higher acid. This is a bit warmer and it has that sort of flavor profile. That's a bit more sort of that yellow spectrum fruit. Yes. Um, when I say yellow, I mean, peach, pineapple, apricot, that kind of thing, more tropical. It has more of that sort of sun-kissed kind of character to it, and the alcohol has comes in. And when you taste alcohol, you get that sort of warming kind of character in the back of your palate. Mm. So the acid is a little bit lower. Um, it has much more textural, creamy viscosity, and the finish on this will be a little bit longer. Uh, yeah. And it's a signature series Viognier, so 2017, which was a which was a phenomenal year. 17 and 19 by far much better years than 18, but you know again. You know, the 18 vintage is beautiful. So perhaps that just showcases what a unique and beautiful vineyard we have and how fortunate we are to work with this kind of fruit. No, indeed. And it's, it's so awesome to do the vertical like this so we can, you know, experience this. And, and you know, not only, you know, the, the living, you know, ground to glass that's going on in this, but the, the beautiful stories that go on too. Because, you know, a lot of times, like you said kind of earlier, there's a, a bit of a cerebral we can get in our heads about this a bit and then there's that emotional human aspect that's tied into all of this that really brings it all back home you know it might even make it that much more delicious you know well, let me ask you this what's what's the what's the most memorable cider or bottle you've ever drunk and then i'll tell you my story what's let me put it this way what what was the the one thing that said i wanted to be a cider maker or what's that one bottle where that light bulb went off and said oh god that's that's what i want to do so i was living in in atlanta georgia at the time and i was working with um, an orchard up there called mercier orchard and they had a dry cider that was the first dry cider that i had had um because we were mainly getting stuff like which you know anyway some other ciders that were not dry and we had come up to Virginia and the first cider that I had was from friends of ours, unbeknownst, we, crazy connection, but the first cider that I had in Virginia was serendipity from Castle Hill. And it was served to me on a friend's porch right up the road at Hartwood Farm, um, Zach Culberson and yeah. the Culberson family, yeah. cheers to them, and <laughs> Cold Country Salmon and whatnot. But anyway, you know, she was like, yeah, it's, it's an apple wine, you know, and I was like, oh my gosh, you know, so I said, and a friend, of, one of the guys that I had worked with in Atlanta had told me about Castle Hill Cider, and he said, you know, they make phenomenal ciders, you know, you can't, you know, I have no idea where you're going to be living, but if they're near you, find out, and it turns out that Castle Hill is five miles down the road from where my wife and I are building our home, <laughs> so everything serendipitously turned into this reality, which I'm very thankful for. And we have wonderful neighbors across the street with a wonderful, wonderful wine. So this is just, you know, amazing to me. So really, it was the serendipity that kind of got me going, you can do this, you know? So, uh, yeah. That's incredible. And, you know, everyone says, what's, what's the best thing you've ever made? The first answer to that is my daughter. Because ah, well done. Yes. Okay. But, <laughs> The thing about wine is um, everyone's like, what's that, what's that one bottle that was memorable? And, you know, I had to think about it and said, I've, I've had the most expensive, I've had 200 old year old wines. Yes. Best bottle I ever had was uh, we closed on our house the day before our wedding. Awesome. We were sitting in an empty house on camping chairs, eating pizza, drinking a $20 bottle of Australian Shiraz with my fiance. It was the <laughs> best bottle of wine I've ever had. You're here. Uh, yeah. And, and again, the best bottle is always shared with someone. Yeah. Um, you know, and yeah, there's, as in cider, there's a lot of work and effort and science that goes into it. But if, if wine can bring people together, if wine can sort of break boundaries, and if wines can bring Republicans and Democrats and black and whites and North yeah. and South together, um, yeah. isn't that the beauty of what we do? 
Yes, try, try exactly. And forget about everything else and just share a glass of wine and say, I love you, brother. I love you, sister. Let's just enjoy this, have fun, and we can yes. disagree tomorrow. And well, uh, that was perfect. Yes, yeah, thank you. Cheers to you. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. We should be That's guzzling it. <laughs> <laughs> So hopefully, I, I don't know how we're doing time and I don't want to monopolize any time or, or from Ethan. I mean, our job really is, is, is very simple at the best of times is we do our best in the vineyard. We, we kind of respect the fruits and hopefully the wine communicates everything that makes Keswick Vineyards unique and special. And that's the soil, uh, the growing season and the topography. We handle it minimalistically, but we do a lot of work on it. And then at the end of the day, we hope people enjoy it. Um, you're not going to like every wine that we, we make. If you do, Alcoholics Anonymous is just a phone call away. Uh, but what you will like about our place is you will always be treated well. We have incredible staff. Yes. If the vineyard is the, uh, the engine of the cruise ship, the heart and soul are the people. And um, you know, I'm blessed to work here and work with Brian and Ethan, and and it's it's so incredible to have you guys across the street. And I look forward to our collaborative cider wines or yes. wine ciders or whatever it may be. Exactly. And those that are watching, uh, the other message we always preach is, you know, with everything going around the world right now, if you're going to drink anything, drink local. You don't yes. have to drink Keswick wine; just drink Virginia wine. If you, you yes, don't have yes. to drink Castle Hill cider, drink. No, you have to drink Castle Hill Cider. <laughs> <laughs> uh, drink, right other cider as well. uh, buy from Virginia groceries and, and restaurants. Exactly. And the other thing is, uh, Americans are resilient. We're going to get through this and we're going to get back to welcoming people. Yes. And, uh, we appreciate all the support. We've been blessed with, with the support. It's been quite overwhelming. So, um, oh, yeah. yeah. Yes. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to shut up because I can't say anything more. And, and I... You know, it's nice to meet you guys, and I hope you enjoyed the wines. We loved it. Thank you yeah. so much. This is delicious, and we're going we're gonna to have a good time for the rest of the day with these three. And we can't wait to see you soon, and I just can't wait to explore some other varietals because this is amazing. This the simple bird, and there's so much going on here. Thank you. No, that's it's great. God yeah, bless. God bless. God bless. And to everyone out there, thank you. <laughs> no, this this vertical is great, um, and I know people watching along that actually have the wines themselves are enjoying all the information. Um, so I'm glad you guys were able to get your bottles. Uh, for those of you who have not gotten these yet, you can get all three Viognier's, all the different labels we've been talking about, all the different styles. So it's $65 with shipping included. So that's free shipping, $65 for oh. all three of these. We'll send them- Only $65? Them along. <laughs> Only 65, that's amazing. These are amazing wines. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm glad you guys have enjoyed them. And, and thank you, Stephen and Ethan, so much for- Thank uh, you. I left the uh, manila envelope with uh, $100 bills on your doorstep there. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Cheers. Thank, thank you, guys. All right, yeah, Just thank you. God bless. See ya.